What a beautiful Sunday morning it is this morning. You know, we've had such wonderful weather. We, it could easily be in the hundreds this time of year, and it's not. Uh, the clouds of mosquitoes are getting pretty thick, but that comes with the rain, and that's very good. If you're a visitor with us this morning, I hope that you are comfortable. I hope that you find that our services are according to God's will. I also hope especially that you find the things that I have to say come from the scriptures, for that's my desire to do so. I want to spend some time this morning talking about Abraham. The scripture said that Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And we're going to talk about that in some detail this morning. But before we really get into the lesson and putting the lesson together, I begin to think about the genealogy of Abraham. And we find that Abraham was the son of Terah and the son of Nahor, and he had a great grand, he was a great grandson and a great great grandson. I know that there are people in this audience that have great grandchildren. My oldest do- uh, granddaughter, married and lives in Borger, announced to us this a few days ago that this month they're going to finalize the adoption of a five year old son. So I'm going to become an immediate great grandfather. And I started thinking about that. And when you look at where we have here is that Abraham, his lineage continued all the way back to Shem. You know who Shem was? Shem was Noah's son. And he was on the ark with Noah. There were ten generations between Noah and Abraham. The nine generations between Shem and Abraham. And if I did my math right, Shem was the great, 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 great grandfather of Abraham. Now, why I bring that up is, is the scriptures tell us that when Abraham was born, his great, 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 great grandfather was still alive, Shem. Now, the scriptures do not tell us for sure that they actually knew each other, they covered on conversations with each other, but they lived in the same area, so you would think that they would. They were kinsmen, and they lived in a part of the, the area that Abraham's, or Abram in this case, kin lived. Can you imagine asking Shem, well, what was it like on the ark? When, when did the water come, and man, how fast did it rise, and how wicked was it before the ark? And what did you do when you got off the boat? Did you feel great about it? Uh, how did you raise crops and so on? Abraham could have talked to Shem and got a first-hand opinion. Now, the scriptures tell us, and we'll look at it here in, in, as we read on here in a few minutes, but Isaac was born 100 years after Abraham was born. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Guess who was still alive? Shem. So he was the great, 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 great grandfather of Isaac. Now, because Abraham was told by God to leave the kinsmen, there's probably, probably Isaac and Shem never really met. That's my guess. But I was thinking about this. Because I am become an instant great-grandfather this month of a five-year-old, if the Lord lets me live to a a ripe old age, there's a good chance that I'm going to have great-great-grandchildren and be able to see them. Now, I may have great-great-grandchildren, but I'm going to be a really old man, and they're going to be a baby, and so they probably won't remember me. I'll probably remember them for a while until I pass on, but they're, they're small, they won't remember me. But guess what? Shem didn't die until Isaac was 50 years old. So he was a grown man, Isaac was. Who knew his great, 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 great grandfather or was alive at the same time. Now, I went through all of that to give you an idea, and we'll talk about it here in the scriptures, that God's time frame is not necessarily man's time frame at all. And what man wants and thinks and doesn't have patience for, God's time frame is much larger and much bigger. There were ten generations from Adam to Noah and ten generations from Noah to Abraham. And Abraham is promised a great nation. 
And he's promised to be, to be the father of kings and so on. Well, it was 12 generations from then until you got to Moses. Now, there was a, a group of people that, I, the, that grew up and were Abraham's nation, shall we say. But if you look in the scriptures, God was also talking about the spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ. And Abraham was going, his direct descendant was going to be Jesus Christ. That was another 12 generations. So when we start looking at our time frame and the way we live, we need to understand that it's not God's time frame. His is much different in most cases than ours. So let's get started. In Genesis, the 12th chapter, it says, Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy, thy father's house, and to a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee. And make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 year, 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So God came to Abram and said, I'm going to make you a great nation. And in doing so, you're going to leave and you're going to travel to where I want you to go. Abram got up and left. The scriptures tell us that Abraham believed. Well, wouldn't you believe? Back in those days and times, God spoke directly to the patriarchs or he sent angels to talk to them. But in any case, if God spoke to me and said, this is going to happen, don't you think I would have believed God? But Abram, which became Abraham, he was human just like the rest of us. And he couldn't figure out how. I understand what you're telling me, God. And yes, I'm getting up and I'm leaving and we're going but I don't have any children and I'm 75 years old and you're asking me to go out and do something. How is this all going to happen? The question had to be in his mind. We sing the song, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. Now, what did Abram do? He walked with the Lord. The Lord sent him out and he went. In the light of his word, he did what God told him to do. What a glory he sheds on the way. He told Abram, he said, I'm going to bless you beyond blessing." And no one's going to get in your way. I'm going to bless you. And those that bless you, I will bless them. And those that curse you, I will curse them. You are protected by me because you're walking in my word. When we do his good will, he abides with us still. And all who will trust and obey. Now, Abram had a pretty good high level of trust in that he left his kinsman, and began to go where God wanted him to go. But he still couldn't understand how it was going to happen. So Abram came up with a plan in Genesis 12 and 11. And it came to pass when he was come near to... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. We find that Abram, there was a great famine, the scriptures tell us. And with that great famine... Abram had to go find food to eat for his family and for those that were with him. And in Genesis 12, I'll get this right, it came to pass that he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai, his wife, who will be Sarah, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that thou shalt say, This is his wife, and they will kill me but they will save thee alive. So I pray thee, thou art my sister, that is, it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Now God had told Abraham that he was going to be the father of a great nation. Why was he worried about the Egyptians killing him? He didn't have as much faith as he needed to have. He looked at his wife and he said, Sarai, he said, you're so good looking that I'm afraid they're going to come and kill me and take you, so you tell them you're my sister. So I won't have to worry about that. You know how old Sarai was? She was about 65 years old, between 65 and 70 when this happened. Now, I don't know about you, maybe back then the, the 65 was the new 30, I don't know, but she had to be a real good-looking woman. 
for him to worry about that. I also think it's strange that in about 15 more years, when Sarai was approaching 90, Abram did exactly the same thing with another king. So maybe when you're 89 years old, that's the new 35. I don't know. But he was worried. But the point being is, is he didn't trust God because God said, I'm going to make a great nation of you. And he said, if I go down there to Egypt, they're going to kill me. And so he figured out what he could do about it. He had a plan. His plan was, you tell him you're my sister. So he was still questioning how all of this was going to happen. And in fact, in the 15th chapter of Genesis, we find that Abram came up with a plan. And Abram said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed. I don't have any children. And lo, one is born in my house is mine. Abram had slaves and he had bond servants, I presume, and other servants that were in his household that, quote, belonged to him. And so one of the heirs of them was going to be his heir because he didn't have any children. So he said, I got the plan. That's what we'll do. But what did God say? This shall not be that, thine heir. But he that shall come forth of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abram had this plan. He said, well, if I'm not going to have any children, I'll take one of my servant's children and I'll make him heir. And God said, that's not what we're going to do. Your heir is going to come from your bowels. It's going to come from you. You are going to be the father. Well, Sarai had a plan. She got involved. His wife bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my, hand, my maid, and it may that be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai, and Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, his maid, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. She had a plan. She said, well, if your offspring has got to come from you, well, then I'm going to give you a surrogate mother. And when that child is born, I'll take care of it as my child. Well, we know that didn't happen. She became very jealous. But the point is that they were trying to figure out how they were going to help God out. Got to have a child. And so let's do this. My older brother sent me a CD, and on that CD there's a song called God's Got a Better Plan. And in the song it says the reasons he won't finish what you started, because he's got a better plan. And he, the plan that Abram, uh, Abram had and the plan that Sarai had was God's plan. And he wasn't going to do that plan. He had his own plan, so even though they were trying to help God out, they weren't. God doesn't need our help. He has the right plan. Genesis 17 and 15 said, And God said unto Abram, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt no more not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. King of people shall be of her. Then Abram fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? God, that's a ridiculous plan. He said, I'm a hundred year old man, and I, don't, I haven't had any children by Sarah, and she's ninety years old. She's, what, I'm, he laughed. He said, that's crazy. Well, that was God's plan. Not Abraham's plan. The thing is, is if you continue to read, you'll find that Abraham finally totally believed in trusting God. How do we know that? Jason read from us where God told Abraham to take Isaac, his only son, that was supposed to be his seed, and sacrifice him, kill him. And Abraham was out to do that and would have done that if the angel had not stopped him. Now, I don't know when 
Abraham finally totally believed that whatever God wanted to do, he could do it. Maybe it's when Sarah got pregnant and had a child, Isaac. But in any case, he finally got to the point where whatever God said was going to happen, happened. Whatever God said, I'm going to believe and I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Hebrews 11 and 17 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, This is Isaac, shall thy seed be called accounting that God would, was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham believed God totally that he felt like that if he killed Isaac, God could raise him from the dead. He totally trusted in God's plan. In James 2 and 23 it says, And the scriptures were fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed or changed are replaced unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. If you want to be God's friend, you've got to obey him, and you've got to trust him. You and I have a better promise than that. For we are his sons and daughters if we obey him and we trust him. We can be his friend, and we can be his children. In Romans 4 and 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Abraham finally got it, and he totally trusted in the Lord. His belief was imputed unto righteousness. Our belief in Jesus Christ is imputed that our sins were put on Him and His righteousness was put on us. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses upon them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He put our sins on his Son. And he charged his Son with our sins. He imputed them on him so that you and I can have the righteousness of Christ. Just as Abraham was able to be righteous because of his belief. If there's anything in the story of Abraham that that you can take from this is that he endured. He had his questions and he was not perfect. And he was human and he questioned what was going on. But he kept going. He endured. That's what we have to do. God's plan is there. We don't need to help God. We need to obey him, we need to trust him, and we need to endure. In Luke 8, where you find the parable of the seeds and the sower sower throwing the seeds, and he explains to his disciples, and that which fell among the thorns are they which when they heard it, uh, go forth, when they heard, go forth, and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to protect perfection, excuse me, The 15th verse says, But that on the good ground are they which in honest and good hearts have heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. It takes patience to be a Christian. It takes patience to serve the Lord. It takes patience to please Him. Jesus said to His twelve, In your patience possess ye your souls. Without patience, we will get discouraged. Our time frames are different than God. Without patience, we won't endure to the end. And so he told his disciples, he says, "Your patience, in your patience, possess ye your souls. Romans 15 and 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. 
In the eighth chapter of Romans it says, For we are saved by hope, patience, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You and I require to have patience to endure. This month with COVID and all that, my patience ran thin. But patience is what we need. We need to trust in God and obey Him. The Apostle John, in writing in Revelations, he looked out and he saw a bunch of saints that had already died and were in heaven. And in Revelation, the 14th chapter, it says, here is the patience of the saints. That they had endured, they had got through. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, for henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. The patience of the saints are those that are in heaven. You and I need patience to endure. We started with the song, Trust and Obey. The chorus goes, Trust and Obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. If we're going to be happy in this life, it doesn't mean we're going to have riches and gold and fame and all that. But to be happy, we need to trust and obey in our Savior. If we do so, and we put down our trust in Him, then whatever happens, we know He's got our back. We know He's the one that's going to see us through. So to be happy in Jesus, it's to trust and obey. I hope there's something in the lesson this morning to get you to think through the week. It is a custom that we offer a song of invitation. There see, be someone that is subject to the gospel call. We ask you to come as we sing two verses of the song selected. <laughs>